if you win this, everybody's NDAs could be lifted. Absolutely. Absolutely. We won. I'm Jessica Denson, and you're watching a very special edition of Lights On. After nearly six years of battle, my brilliant legal team and I just voided hundreds of illegal Trump NDAs, forever freeing Donald Trump's former staffers to speak the truth about him and his campaign. We're going to take you on that incredible journey, its massive implications for democracy, and introduce you to this stellar team of mine. Please join me in welcoming three of my brilliant lawyers, David K. Bowles of Bowles & Johnson, down there in the right-hand corner, John Langford up top from Protect Democracy, and Joseph Slaughter of Ballard Spar. Hey guys, so great to have you together here. Thanks so much for having me, Jessica. Great to be on. Thanks for having us. So I want to take I want to take our viewers and listeners on this incredible journey of how we got here and what it means. But uh, before we do that, I just want to open the floor up to the three of you. Um, maybe starting with David, we're going to explain kind of how this team amassed. But David was the first after after a year of me handling my case pro se. What are your thoughts right off the top, David? Well, right off the top, first of all, Jessica started all this on her own with actually starting two lawsuits against the Trump campaign, which has got to be as uh, intimidating as it can be, um, one in federal court and one in state court. And um, she did all this and had some triumphs on her own for about a year before she brought us in. And uh, I had to go back and take a look. It's almost five years ago to the day that we were retained. It was October 18th, um, uh, five years ago that we were retained. So it's been that long of a journey and it's been very exciting. Uh, we did it alone, uh, not alone. I had a colleague, Maury Josephson, that I should call out, who was very instrumental in working the case, Jessica's case at the beginning. Uh, but we took it on, we took it on pro bono and um, we managed to get some things done. We had a big triumph at the uh, first department. Um, and after that, it attracted enough, enough attention that my uh, colleagues, uh, Joe Slaughter and John Langford were able to come on board along with the rest of their teams. And it's just been a very exciting journey since then, leading up to the fantastic culmination last week in federal court uh, that we're talking about today. Absolutely, and yes, shout out to Mari Josephson, who we will discuss um, some more of his very significant contributions as we, as we walk through this. But um, take us forward, John, what do you have? <laughs> Well, David said it well. I mean, I think you were our first and lead counsel before anybody was on the team. And then, you know, I first became aware of your case here at Protect Democracy when you and with David's help uh, managed to overturn an arbitration award in state court, which almost never happens and achieved an amazing victory at the appellate division um, for the New York um, state courts. Um, it's one of the things that I find most impressive about what you did and sort of how you um, initiated the drive that led to the result um, last week is that you took on the Trump campaign at the moment that it was at its apex of its power. Donald Trump had just won the presidential election. He was the president. He was in the business of silencing people and after aggr and aggressively going after people who said anything remotely bad about him. And you alone started this lawsuit to um, push back on that and turned out to be right on the law and turned out to be right in terms of what was just and what was important for the country. So it's a remarkable achievement. Thank you so much, John. And I've gotten to know what um, what an absolute rock star this whole team is. John has has um, also amassed some other amazing victories of protect democracy along this journey. Um, we won't name names, but let's suffice it to say he's fighting forces of evil in very big ways. Um, and then as after we got the team from protect democracy, we were also joined by Ballard Spar, Dave Schultz, First Amendment lawyer, and the brilliant Joe Slaughter, who is here with us today. Um, Joe, love to hear you weigh in. Sure. J just a couple of things. Well, number one, we're not naming names yet, but maybe later uh, on the program, we can <laughs> put John on blast um, for some of the great work he's done. And I just want to just build on a couple of the things that David and John said about Jessica, your leadership on this and your, you know, gumption in, in, in doing this on your own until we came aboard. Um, you know, this was not a easy case. 
by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think anybody at the beginning, maybe with the exception of Jessica, thought that this was going to come out the way it was. I know I certainly didn't. I thought it was a worthy cause and worth fighting, but um, you know, it was it was you know a testament to this team and to Jessica that we were able to get a positive resolution in, instead of you know getting kicked out of court in ten minutes, which was a real possibility. Um, and the other thing I just want to say to all of you is how much of a pleasure it's been working with this specific group, how cohesive we are, and how that makes a difference to the results. And I, um, you know, raise my non-existent glass to, to all the <laughs> folks on the on the on this podcast. It really has been a pleasure, and it's been you know it's been a collaboration every single step of the way. Um, and and we've we've had like you said, Joe, unexpected but amazing successes. So I kind of wanted to take everybody back to the inception. Um, how did we get here? And we got here, um, the viewers of Lights On will be familiar with a sentiment that I have shared many times, which is I, I kind of had an existential crisis in, in 2017 as my statute of limitations was about to run out for possible employment claims and defamation claims that I would be able to raise against the Trump campaign. I had had a nightmarish, um, I've accurately described as a reign of terror working on this campaign. Um, and walked away from it living under a dark cloud, very much wanting to put this behind me and uh, you know correct my own errors and mistakes and having worked for the campaign in the first place. And um, in the midst of this existential crisis, I, I came to the conclusion that I couldn't do that. I couldn't live with myself if I walked away. And so this entire legal battle started with me filing a pro se human rights and defamation lawsuit against the Trump campaign in November of 2017. And I had no idea where this was going to take me, um, except that I knew I was doing the right thing. And I, I had faith in that God directed um, action that I took, that that would sustain me. And the first thing that happened right out of the gate, and this became a trend on, on Christmas Eve or, or the, the eve of Christmas Eve, um, the Trump campaign filed a $1.5 million arbitration demand against me for having allegedly violated the NDA by filing that human rights lawsuit. Um, at this point, I was still desperately trying to find a legal team, had not even served papers on the campaign, and um, was obviously um, terrified, but also realizing that I had to address this. And instead, instead of entering into that arbitration that they proposed that I did, they also proposed that I just, um, you know, say uh, thank you for um, giving me a little motion to dismiss to sign off on. I'll gladly just dismiss my lawsuit in court and step into your arbitration. Of course, I didn't do that. Um, and over the next couple of months, I, I kind of thought about how wrong this had to be, how illegal it had to be. I didn't understand all of the reasons why quite yet, but I knew that I had to handle it proactively. And so the next step I took rather than entering their arbitration, which might have been a fool's errand from a legal perspective at that point, was I filed another pro se lawsuit in March of 2018 um, to void this non-disclosure agreement. And um, in, that, in that process, I um, went to court pro se in state court. That was a federal case. I went to court in, in uh, state court pro se and won a very significant victory that kept my claims out of arbitration because they used the NDA to try to force my human rights claims, not necessarily the sex discrimination claims, but the related common law claims like defamation and um, you know, emotional distress, other claims that were related to my case, they tried to force into arbitration. And as a pro se litigant, I went and argued against the campaign lawyers and got that successfully kept out of arbitration. But, but um, the initial NDA lawsuit was not, I was not successful in keeping that out of arbitration because of a very clear arbitration clause in the agreement that says matters relating to this agreement must be arbitrated. So we're going to fast forward a little to the point where I met David. And um, as he mentioned, it was it's almost five years to this day that I retained him. And right before I retained David and Mari, 
in their arbitration that they had brought against me, the $1.5 million one and my subsequent NDA lawsuit that was forced into arbitration that I didn't participate in, they succeeded in getting what would become a $50,000 arbitration award and judgment against me. So I just want to, I want to take this moment. I mean, I met David and David had such a positive spirit about tackling this NDA too. He wasn't, he wasn't satisfied to say, we're just going to handle your employment discrimination claims. He was all on board for invalidating this NDA. And he, and him and Mari took on my case at a low when I had this arbitration award entered against me. Um, and maybe David, you can just pick up from here and talk about what we had to handle at the moment when you joined my team. Absolutely. And thanks. Um, yeah, Mari Josephson, uh, again, I mentioned him, brilliant employment lawyer. I've done other cases with him. He and I have worked together uh, on different things for years. Uh, so I hadn't heard of uh, Jessica in uh, 2018. Uh, but Mari calls me up and says, essentially, hey, do you want to sue Trump? And I'm like, hell yes, I would love to sue Trump. That would be great. Uh, turned out to be the Trump campaign, but close enough. Um, and then he introduced me to the case and he introduced me to Jessica. And again, this was at a point where Jessica had already been spending a year in court pro se. And I have to tell you again, how impressive that is and how well she did at that. Uh, but nonetheless, at this point, she needed counsel. The big thing, like she said, was at this point, she had sued the Trump campaign for sex discrimination. Immediately after that, uh, a month after that, the Trump campaign countersues her in arbitration um, and that's where it gets complicated. They asked for $1.5 million. And Jessica, as it turns out, in retrospect, rightfully, didn't show up, did not show up for the arbitration. She said, this is an illegal uh, document. It's got, the arbitration clause is there for illegal. I'm not coming. So when it came to us, it was at a point where the um, uh, she had already put herself in what we'd call a default position with the arbitration. So they won a $50,000 award without her ever appearing and without us being there on the stage in time to do so, even if we wanted to. So that was the stage when uh, we met Jessica. So tough case right from the beginning, not just a sex discrimination case, but the uh, position that she was in in the arbitration award. So we were fighting uphill from the very beginning, um, but took a look at the NDA and it took about 15 seconds to realize that it was stupid uh, it was terribly written. It was, um, I thought, from the very beginning, unenforceable on a technical basis. Also, you pulled in the issues of a, a presidential campaign uh, gagging its employees so they couldn't talk about the candidate and then later the president. And it just seemed all wrongful to me. And I think Jessica's instincts were proved out on that. So like John said earlier, we went to invalidate uh, or vacate the arbitration award. Uh, it, we took that to state court. State court said, no, the arbitration award is rubber stamped and that's what they generally do. Um, and we took it up to the first department, which is the first appellate court from New York state court. And the first department, we were able to convince that the arbitration award should be vacated on public policy. John mentioned earlier that that's hard to do. It almost never happens that arbitration awards are vacated. They're designed to be bulletproof. And, you know, that's what attracted everybody's attention that we actually got that done. Uh, so we got the arbitration award overturned after, I don't know what, Jessica, a year and a half or something of fighting? Uh, it took yeah. some time. Yeah. Um, and uh, then we were able, to, after that was done, to go back to um, uh, fighting in court. So we had the idea of not just invalidating Jessica's NDA. Jessica um, said, told us that everybody else signed the same NDA. So we thought, why not do this as a class action? Why not do this for everybody that worked for the Trump campaign? Yeah. Um, and with Jessica's permission and support and actually becoming the lead plaintiff in that matter, we filed first a class action arbitration because there was an arbitration clause in uh, the Trump campaign. And, and they had they, they had demanded arbitration of my NDA claim. So we said, you want arbitration? And this is David's brilliant idea. He said, OK, they want arbitration. We're going to do a class action arbitration. Yeah. And we took it to him. I said, take us to an arbitrator. So we took it to him, along with the other yeah. 421 people, as it turned out, who had signed that NDA. And it turns out they didn't want that either. They were yeah. not happy with the uh, class action arbitration. So complicated series of events. But ultimately, they just said, take us to court, to which we said, that's where we were to begin with. But fine, throw us into the federal court, throw us into that particular briar patch. 
and that's what we did. We got it uh, refiled uh, as a um, uh, federal class action uh, to invalidate the NDA. And that's where my valued colleagues come in. Yeah, and I want to definitely um, pull in John and Joe on the on the illegal illegality of that NDA. Why, from a legal standpoint, it's it's um, totally untenable and overly broad. But just to take us back to that moment, David, where um, we filed that first iteration of the class action, what, which was the class action arbitration. And um, to give people a, an idea of where we were at this point, I have this fifty thousand dollar judgment hanging over my head. Um, I had I had spoken, you know, I had obviously wanted to speak so much. I had spoken through my lawsuit, but I was terrified for that first year to speak otherwise publicly on the record because that's the way this NDA is written. It's so arbitrary that you know that anything you say can or will be used against you by Donald Trump to stifle criticism and punish you, use you as an example, intimidate you. Um, I had that $50,000 judgment consisted in part of tweets that I had on a, an account with 32 followers with a GoFundMe that I barely raised that not even, I think it was something like $1,200. And they were literally trying to disgorge $1,200 that I raised in an attempt to get the legal team that I desperately needed. Um, that was the extremity of their attacks on my free speech. And so I, other than those very meager attempts to kind of just get help. I largely did not make on the record comments until I got David and Mario on my team. And the first thing we did was um, we accepted, you know, an invitation to go on national television. And like John said, you know, this is the height of Donald Trump's assault on our democracy through his presidency, just the, us getting to see in full relief how dangerous he was. And I had, you know, I've discussed this more in other, other contexts, but I had come to a realization then of how mistaken and ignorant I was supporting this man and how much we needed to raise the alarms. And I just wanted to play the clip of, um, of what I said to the American people in that moment when I finally had the support of David and Mari and um, was able to issue this warning in spite of being threatened um, from all sides by the Trump campaign. Um, these, these NDAs say that someone who signed them will have a lifetime of allegiance to everything related to Trump. That if they dare to do anything but praise and be a sycophant for this president, that they their very livelihood will be threatened. This is this is un-American. It's unconstitutional. I would say that the document is a ludicrous document, but my case is proof that they are being used in real ways to punish people with stories that the American people need to know now more than ever and before it's too late. We reached out to the Trump campaign uh, to see what their response to all of this was, and they did not give us an official statement. If you win this, everybody's NDAs could be lifted. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to uh, toss this to you, Joe, um, just to kind of go over some of the terms of that NDA, why they're so egregious and how they stifled criticism during Donald Trump's presidency. Sure. Yeah. And let me um, I, I'm happy to do that. And I want to I want to say a couple of things um, about what David Bowles said a minute ago. I, David, I didn't realize that you were um, so clairvoyant that you looked at this and knew we were going to win. I certainly didn't have that um, view, but. Um, but obviously this this was borne out. Um, you know, you were right, I was wrong. Um, so let me say a couple of things. So one thing is, you know, these contracts, I mean, you everyone, what everyone said is right. If you read them, these particular contracts, they are really egregiously overbroad because what they essentially say is um, you know, you by signing this, you will never say a bad word about Donald Trump. You will never say a bad word about any person associated with Donald Trump. Um, you will never tell anyone publicly anything that you've learned um, while working here, no matter how pedestrian or mundane. And they're just written in this incredibly overbroad way that is sort of the quintessential example of what people think of when they think about, you know, consumer contracts where you really don't have a choice. You just, if you want to, if you want to have access to the thing that's being sold, you have to sign on to all these onerous terms. And, and I think that this case is sort of instructive um, because the, you know, people tend to think that an NDA is like magic, right? Like I signed an NDA and somehow, you know, there's crazy glue on my lips and I can't open them. And that's, that's not the case. The reality is that um, it works the way that Jessica experienced. If you sign an NDA and if you have a 
person on the other side of that that's mean and vindictive and wants to use it to silence criticism, you are, you know, potentially going to find yourself in the crosshairs. That's exactly what happened, how Trump acts and how his campaign acts and how people in his orbit um, act. Um, that's not how every NDA is. And I think I just want to take a minute to dispel the notion that an NDA is magic. An NDA is just a contract like any other. You are agreeing to a term. Um, but if if there is a reason under the law or under the facts why that term cannot and should not be enforced, um, you know, it's not it's not like your lips are actually sealed. Um, this one is different. This one, you know, so the so the flip side of that, what I wanted to say is that um, courts are generally skeptical of people that are trying to get out of these contracts because most cases like this arise in the context of like settling litigation. You hear about this all the time, right? Something bad happens in a workplace. Um, the employee, you know, makes noise about a lawsuit. Management pays them off. And part of that settlement is an NDA where they agree not to publicly talk about this because that is what management is, you know, in paying these people that money. This is what they're bargaining for, right? This is what they get out of it. They pay you money and you go quietly. Um, this is a very different scenario. This is an upfront um, term of the con contractual term that anyone that wanted to join the campaign and work for this man had to sign on to. That's one difference. The other difference is that it's so incredibly broad, right? That we were able to point out all these ways in which it really made no sense um, for something like this to be enforceable. And the way the law works in New York at a high level is it's, it basically says, you know, a company is allowed to um, impose these kinds of conditions if they have a good reason, right? And there's just, they, you could, they, Trump campaign easily could have written an NDA that was defensible in court. It would have said something like, you cannot disclose, you know, our, campaign plans or our internal polling or our, you know, even our organizational structure, things that they really could arguably say um, they had an interest in, in keeping private and protected. That's not what they did. They just said, you can never say anything ever or else we'll sue you into oblivion, which is sort of the, the very much the Donald Trump, like, you know, um, if you throw a rock at me, I'm going to throw a boulder at you approach to life. Um, and, and so that was where we were able originally to find sort of a hook for challenging this. And there's sort of two aspects to what we challenged. One was, as I think David Bowles was saying, that this was just so overly broad the way it was written that New York contract law just wouldn't, doesn't allow you to do what they wanted to do. And the other was a sort of more um, academic, highfalutin argument about, you know, the first, because this is, was a political campaign and because you know, the First Amendment is such an important part of the political process and free speech about political candidates. It's such a core value um, of our form of government that you really shouldn't be able to do this in that context, even if you might be able to do it in some other context. And I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I guess when we talk about what actually happened in court, um, we'll figure out how the judge, how the judge dealt with that, um, you know, that context, those, those two sort of strains of argument that we made. Yeah, if we can, um, I mean, we, we made both of those arguments and absolutely, um, you know, I will always believe we had those arguments to make because even though the campaign is a private entity, uh, they were using, Donald Trump was using his campaign as a cutout while president to stifle people's free speech, to, um, to uh, violate their first amendment rights to criticize him. He was using that private entity um, via this NDA that literally silenced people for life. Uh, if we can pull up some of the terms of that NDA, I've shared these before, but they are so outrageous. Um, the no disparagement uh, one, it says, during the term of your service and at all times thereafter, you hereby promise and agree not to demean or disparage publicly the company, Mr. Trump, any Trump company, any family member or any family member company or any asset dot, 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 basically encompassing hundreds and hundreds of unnamed Trump entities. You are pro prohibited from criticizing 
Avanga's fragrance line for the rest of your life. That's how um, that's how encompassing it, this is and uh, how much it gags people. And then on the confidentiality terms, this is the real this is the real uh, crazy one. We can pull that graphic up again. It says confidential information means all information, whether or not embodied in any media of a private, proprietary or confidential matter. And here's the clincher or that Mr. Trump insists remain private or confidential, dot, dot, dot. I mean, this is a completely arbitrary, undefinable notion that uh, his former staffers are just supposed to divine um, what Donald Trump may or may not um, consider confidential and that, that the judge uh, definitely, um, as we'll discuss, came down on this overly broad uh, contract contractual term. Um, but just to, to get back to that journey, I think we left off where we left off where um, I was. We were bringing the class action arbitration. They rejected the class action arbitration. We fought this uh, fifty thousand dollar judgment in the appellate division in New York State Court, as David was telling you, and um, almost over a year later, literally the day after Donald Trump was acquitted acquitted uh, in the first impeachment, February 6th, 2020, the first department threw out that $50,000 judgment. Um, I've always said it's always darkest before the dawn and you wouldn't believe the um, pressure that was taken off of me when that happened. I, I lived under such, I, I felt like a version of a political prisoner for the, for the time that I was living under that $50,000 judgment. Um, and they they definitely used it. I mean, they used it as a weapon to try to get me to drop my India, uh, my human rights lawsuit. Um, so many times they they tried to get me to walk away, and we held out. And uh, John, maybe you can pick up from here on on what where you you and Protect Democracy came in when we um, won that that decision on appeal. I'm I'm happy to. I was wondering if we might throw it to you, David, for just one second. I, one moment that has always stuck out to me, when you had the oral argument at the appellate division, you've always said one of the judges said something about driving a Mack truck through this uh, <laughs> yes. contract. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it was a really fun argument. The first department's always fun. You've always got a hot bench that asks you all sorts of questions and pepper you. And one of the judges was just outraged at this contract. He said, look at this thing. You got It's got holes in it. You could drive a Mack truck through. And the two big things that, um, uh, that I always call out are exactly the two that uh, Jessica, being essentially a new mint, newly minted lawyer, called out, which is the fact that you can't tell from this contract who could sue you and you can't tell what they could sue you for, right? Because there are like 500 Trump organizations that might fall within that description that she had on the screen a minute ago. And Ivanka's fragrance line might come out of the woodwork and sue you for criticizing one of her perfumes or a handbag or something like that. You really couldn't tell. And even when we asked the Trump campaign, like who are all these other entities? They couldn't tell us either. Um, and the idea that uh, Trump retroactively gets to decide what's supposed to be confidential is so insane that that judge on the first department recognized it. I think that's the kind of thing he was talking about. Um, and so that was the win. That was the hard part, by the way. Joe accused me of clairvoyance a minute ago, which I'm not. But I felt like after we got over that barrier, uh, invalidating the NDA ultimately, probably the other judges are going to feel like the guy on the first department. And so I'll say just a, a very high level version of Protect Democracy. Jessica did an amazing interview with our executive director, Ian Basson, a couple of weeks ago. And if you haven't listened to it or seen it, highly recommend you go check it out. Mm -hmm. um, both Jessica and Ian um, just offered very nuanced takes about the importance of protecting our democracy and protect democracy's work in that space, um, which Jessica is very familiar with. But that very high level version is protect democracy was formed in 2016 to prevent our democracy from declining into a more authoritarian form of government. And the sort of major insight here is that, you know, pre 1960s, typically the way authoritarian governments came to power was through some sort of coup d'etat, tanks rolling down the streets and um, sort of a, a, a violent uprising. But more recently, the way we see democracies um, deteriorate and fall into authoritarian forms of government is through what Protect Democracy likes to call the authoritarian playbook. Mm -hmm. So it's through these um, coming to power, sometimes legitimately through elections, but then using power to do things that undermine the democracy. And those things include politicizing independent institutions, 
spreading disinformation, aggrandizing executive power, marginalizing vulnerable communities, corrupting elections and stoking violence. And so, you know, when Trump came to power, we were looking out for uh, the ways in which Donald Trump and his administration were taking steps to do those things. And one of the things that he very clearly did and enjoyed doing was quashing dissent, trying to silence his opponents, his superpower, Trump's superpower is controlling the narrative. Whatever else you want to say about the guy, he has a preternatural ability to keep the spotlight focused on him and to convince some set of people that his word is gospel and everybody else um, is a pagan and a heathen and should be burned at the stake. Um, and one of the most pernicious ways he did that was through these NDAs. And like Jessica said, he was actively in the first year of his administration going after people. The campaign was going after people seemingly at his direction to silence them and to keep them from, from offering facts, the, the contrary view to what he would say was the state of the world. And so we were looking out for ways to try to challenge that practice. And um, a decision came down actually in the Fourth Circuit where Fourth Circuit overturned a police settlement with um, a, a, a woman who um, whose civil rights were very clearly violated. She settled with the police department and then the police department, notwithstanding there was an agreement not to say anything about the settlement, started saying things about her. So she started saying things. And then the police department sued her. And the Fourth Circuit said, whoa, whoa, whoa. There, there's, this is a First Amendment problem. So we were on the lookout for cases like that that could, could be used to go after what Trump was doing. And I happened to see um, one of the news reports about um, Jessica and David's victory at the First Department. And so I thought, you know what, I'll give David Bowles a call and just see if he might be interested. And the timing was fortuitous. David said, we're, you know, we would love your assistance on this if, if you're willing to do it. And was, um, he has been, always has been the most generous, um, gracious, wonderful partner, just like Joe and, and Dave Schultz and everybody else we work with invited us in. And we started this amazingly collaborative relationship. And I got a chance to meet Jessica very early on in Los Angeles because we wanted to make sure that Jessica was not... <laughs> You got to tell everybody about your suspicions. <laughs> oh, I, I said the, you have to old, tell everybody about your suspicions. <laughs> the only suspicion is just to be very sure. You know, there are lots of uh, groups out there that do with expose journalism and like to try to catch you on recording and then take a snippet and then put it out there and say, this is whatever. So just trying to make sure that Jessica wasn't some sort of strange person who <laughs> might do something that would really upend our ability to do work more broadly. Um, but of course, Jessica is who she is. And immediately when you talk to Jessica or you hear her talk, as everybody who watches this show knows, um, she's as genuine a person, she's as spirited a fighter as she comes off as. And you know, you can't hope for clients better than Jessica. So that part was put to bed very early and we got to work. <laughs> the only thing that kept us from filing the lawsuit in March was COVID, shut down all the courts in New York, and we had to go uh put everything on ice for a few months here while the courts figured out whether they were gonna open up and when. Um, and if I could say one more word, which is, of course. you know, David, obviously um, with Jessica, you launched this thing and David took it and had the brilliant insight, really truly brilliant to propose a class action to go after everybody. Yes. Um, and then litigated it amazingly effectively, honed in on the exact claims that ultimately won the day. But there's no way that protect democracy um, would have been able to do this, or David, uh, correct me if I, you think I'm wrong, if Joe Slaughter in particular <laughs> and Dave Schultz had not come into the case and whipped everything, the, the two of them rock are Absolutely. rock stars. And I mean, yes. we're just blessed with rock stars on all sides. David Bowles is a rock star, Joe Slaughter is a rock star, David Schultz is a rock, is a rock star. So it's sort of like a, a, just a wonderful dream team to be able to work with on a case like this. I gotta oh, say, yeah. it's, it's great to hear that I'm super generous for allowing you guys to come in and save us at a time when we were so overwhelmed with an extraordinarily complex bunch of litigation and a COVID uh, crisis at the same time. I mean, it, you guys were saviors to come in at that time. Uh, it was it was still going to be a tough road. We had won the um, uh, getting the arbitration award overturned, but we were a long way down the road. And I also will throw out praise for Joe and Dave. Um, uh, as being the absolute masters of the class action form, which I certainly am not. Uh, the class action arbitration, okay. And then when we flip it over to a federal class action, 
sooner or later I was going to be over my head in that. And uh, there are extreme uh, experience in this, uh, particularly when you layer over their First Amendment experience, uh, was absolutely invaluable. So great for you guys to come in at that time. Well, I, I just have to say, I don't think you guys understand that the point of these shows is to draw up controversy, not to be nice to each other. So, uh, <laughs> no. But also, I agree with all that, but we should also mention briefly um, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press and the law firm Davis and Gilbert, um, who filed really helpful amicus briefs for us when we finally got the case going in federal court that I think um, went a long way to convincing the judge that this was a real issue and, and something he had to deal with rather than just a, a kooky case that he could give the back of his hand to. Yeah. As long as we're complimenting everybody, we should compliment Judge Gardeffi. Because, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, um, it was a long road getting here for sure. But on the other hand, uh, early on, he took a look at this. We did cross motions to dismiss and for summary judgment. Uh, he denied their motion to dismiss. He granted outright uh, Jessica's motion for summary judgment. We won on liability up front. Uh, uh, at, in this case, that really means that Jessica's NDA was invalidated. Um, and after that, it was just the nuts and bolts and mechanics of turning it into a, a win for the rest of the class. And he saw that all the way through. Uh, we had a fairness hearing the other day. I'm jumping ahead of the schedule, I guess. Um, but I, I really um, thought his opinions were strong and solid, and uh, he really came through uh, for Jessica and for us and for the whole class. Let me um, let me say one thing, jumping off that, David, just taking it back to, uh, to me, I think maybe the most light bulb moment in this entire case. Um, we did some boring lawyer stuff at the beginning. You know, we filed the case in June of 2020 some boring lawyer stuff for a couple months. We finally got our first, got to actually be in front of Judge, Gard Judge Gardeffi for the first time. And this was deep, you know, deep in the beginning of the pandemic. So we weren't literally in front of him, we were on the phone. But, you know, the Trump, ca the campaign and Trump in general, in all of his various lit litigations has sort of one goal, delay, 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 throw some bullshit out there, try to push off the inevitable reckoning as long as you can. Um, you know, we we all see that every day with the criminal stuff that he's going through now and with every serious civil case he's had. He always just wants to deflect, delay, blame somebody else, keep it away from any actual resolution. That's exactly what they tried to do here at the beginning. They're, you know, that's why we ended up in court, right? Because they said, go to arbitration. And we got to arbitration and they said, no, 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 we, you can't be here for some technical reason. And ultimately ended up, you know, shooting themselves in the foot um, by doing that because we, you know, they then tried to argue again later that this couldn't be in court. And we were able to throw their own language back at them that said, if you want to bring this claim, they literally, there's an email that says, if you want to bring this claim, you have to do it in court from the campaign's lawyer. Um, but I digress a little bit. What I really wanted to say is that we get on this initial call with Judge Gardeffi, and I think this was in August of 2020. And we really didn't know what was gonna happen. They had all these reasons why this thing had to be drawn out over a long period of time. We had all these reasons why this needed to be decided as soon as possible, primarily because there was an upcoming election and we wanted to hopefully um, you know, free people from these onerous contracts in time that they could come forward and speak and, and, and say what they needed to say while voters were still, um, had a chance to make their decision. So we get on the call with Gardefi, and basically the first thing he said was, why shouldn't we just do summary judgment right now? And what some, that, that essentially is the lawyer's version of saying, why don't we just skip to the end of the case right now and I'll decide who's right and who's wrong. And that was a huge win for us um, because it, we absolutely, you know, didn't exactly work out that way in the end, but we wanted this resolved as soon as possible the campaign wanted to delay it as long as possible. And the judge gave us a really strong and powerful signal at the very beginning that he understood where we were coming from. He understood that there were some major issues with this stuff and we had a potentially, you know, real claim here. Um, and that he wanted to, he wanted it in front of him right away and he wanted to do something about it. And that was, to me, that was sort of a huge moment um, that, that made me think, okay, wait, maybe we maybe we really are going to get where we need to go here. Yeah, that yeah, really, really was one to me one of the many indications of this being uh, divinely guided. Just having that ability to file those cross motions right away, even though we didn't get a decision um, right off the bat. 
But all, all of you guys were, were mentioning things that <clears throat> I wanted to just pick up on some threads. First of all, just going back to what David said about the class action, um, you know, I was so grateful for that education and guidance in, in filing a class action. I've got to say, back in 2018, when I first filed the NDA pro se lawsuit individually, I thought this will have the implication if I win, this will affect everybody who signed one. Um, but the problem with that is that these are arbitration agreements that they try to target people with individually. These they hide these fights. Um, you don't. You have to understand. I, I, Joe said this. I think you know way in the beginning that people, even when they sign an illegal agreement, number one, they may not know it's illegal, and number two, they very much consider themselves bound. For all of the you know highfalutin legal talk out there about how ridiculous these NDAs are, you better believe they are very real to the people who sign them. And so um, even though, you know, with my limited legal knowledge in the beginning, thinking an individual victory would would affect everybody, um, you know, this team took the long haul to guarantee that we, in fact, released everybody who was bound. Um, but that I, th just to get into the weeds, because I think this is this, again, is so special and so divine. That statement from the campaign that if you want to bring a class action, you can bring it in court. I mean, it was like absolute gift to us. And it actually came out when I, when David and Mari and I were fighting that $50,000 judgment. And I was, like I said, the pressure, I can't describe the pressure that I felt, the fear that I felt during that year plus that I was living under it. And I and David and Mari will test this one day. You know, I gave them a run for their money. I was very upset. And I said, we have to um, basically alert the courts in every way possible that we were basically getting to a point. The campaign was trying to foreclose us from ever having an actual legal reading of the NDA. They were just basically trying to shut the door on us with with default judgments. And we had actually been fighting the $50,000 judgment in federal court and state court because of the campaign bringing us to both forums to do this. It was really just a waste of the court's time. And so after the state court had already denied us, I we were fighting it still in federal court. And I asked David and Mari, I said, please bring them up to date. Please bring the federal court up to date on the fact that the campaign is rejecting our class action arbitration. They wanted to arbitrate. Now they're rejecting it. Please let's tell the court. So David and Mari filed this letter with the federal court telling them about that rejection. And that is where in response, the campaign you know, put a nail in their own coffin and said, because they thought I was just gonna walk away. They thought they had won. They said, if Miss Denson wants to file a class action, she can file it in court. Year later, we get that arbitration demand thrown out, and sure as hell, we file it in court. Trump campaign. <laughs> yeah, that was a real gift. When they said that, that was spectacular because it really was a briar patch moment. Please throw us into that briar patch. Yeah. But going back to the very beginning here, the the NDA itself and the way they treated that fifty thousand um, uh, dollar award that they got, the default judgment in arbitration. Uh, the phrase I always think of is performative assholery. <laughs> uh, which is what the uh, campaign has been engaged in. And it, it, it's a Trump tactic, right? Because first they get this, uh, first they, they draft it in this ridiculous way that no lawyer should have ever signed off on. And then after they get a $50,000 award against Jessica, uh, they just batter us for a while. Remember, Jessica, you didn't mention oh, yes. they, they, they seized our escrow accounts, yes. or at least tried to. They um, froze they, my they, bank account. They tried to seize yep. your escrow account. They They absolutely, it was very, very frightening. Yeah, they were all over us with every enforcement mechanism. And always it was with the uh, background beat of just walk away, just walk away, just walk yep. away. You know, that's what they try to do. They try to batter people, scare them and intimidate them into walking away. And it turns out that Jessica is unintimidable, unintimidable, um, <laughs> cannot be intimidated and uh, cannot be forced to walk away uh, and manage to stand up to all that. But it was sketchy in the middle there. Yeah, and I want to make I want to bring up one other technical aspect, and that is that when um, when David and Mari and I filed the first class action arbitration, um, there were other somewhat high profile NDA um, disputes. And number one, the di the distinction between ours and those others was that we were the only one. I was the only one who had challenged the NDA proactively. Everybody else was handling it from. Um, 
a defensive posture. Uh, I think with one exception, which was Cliff Sims, who I think brought a limited NDA claim, ended up actually settling it uh, confidentially. But the other ones were um, handling on a, handling it from a defensive posture. At that time, um, we invited people in the public arena that had disputes to join the class action. And nobody joined me <laughs> other than um, a man from Texas wanted to join who had been, a, 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 we, we never really determined if he was actually a volunteer employee, but he had a signed NDA from the campaign that he signed. Um, they rejected it based on the fact that they had never signed it. Never mind, they had never actually signed mine either. But they said we never signed his, so he can't join as a as a um, as a class representative. So the, the reason I'm bringing this all up is because because I was alone, because nobody else joined me as a class representative. I was the only one that maintained the posture to be able to then challenge them in court. If others had been with me when they threw out the class action arbitration, um, they may have been able to join me as class representatives, but I was the only one that had that standing um, when we actually did get to court to challenge it in court. And I, I just want everybody to appreciate how special that was to have gone through all those hoops and then have standing to challenge what is an arbitration agreement in a court of law, um, it was truly divine. And then <clears throat> as you guys have discussed, we we got our fast track. We didn't get it fast enough but for the 2020 election, but I did get that individual victory, which absolutely was key in enforcing the campaign to the settlement that I think we're hopefully gonna discuss in just a second, this huge victory um, in March of 2021. And that individual court victory um, was a precedent that actually helped some of those other high profile cases. And I do wanna put that out there because there has been some misinformation about um, you know, what cases uh, came first or what cases were um, setting the precedent. It was actually our precedent in summary judgment, that initial massive victory in March of 2021 that freed the other people who were defensively challenging um, these, these NDA attacks. And then of course, of course we press forward and maybe John, you can take us um, take us to where we went when we uh, won my individual victory and we pressed forward with the class action. Sure, um, and so I think it might be worth just a minute on what the decision was. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, you know, we brought a first amendment claim and um, one of the things to point out is you, you mentioned it, the First Amendment on its term says the government can't prohibit speech. So how can you bring a First Amendment claim against a um, political campaign? And we had good arguments there um, that, you know, we had three arguments. We had one, which is the courts actually enforce contract law. So much like the theory of what allows First Amendment law to intervene in defamation cases under New York Times versus Sullivan, there's a First Amendment path there. The second is that the campaign was controlled by the president who was a government official. So even if you think it's a private actor, it's controlled by the state. And third is it was enforced directly by Donald Trump, or at least enforceable directly by Donald Trump. Um, ultimately, and, and then we brought the series of contract claims that David um, teed up and that um, Joe led the charge and David led the charge on briefing in the, our motion for summary judgment. And ultimately the court did not rule on the First Amendment claims. What the court said is that the contract law carries a day here. These terms are too vague to be enforceable. Um, and Joe, maybe I should kick you for just a minute and on that one piece, but um, a, a couple of things, ways that the First Amendment did come in in really important ways are one, the court understood and said in this decision, there is a problem with these NDAs and that they chill really important political speech. That's a First Amendment idea, the chilling effect. That's not a contract law case. That's a, uh, concern. That's that's a First Amendment concern. And I think he was he was right about that. So in a way, you can see the First Amendment interest sort of motivating the decision there. Um, and then second, actually, when they we filed in state court, and I think we would have won in both courts, although maybe that's like too bold. Um, but they removed to federal court and they did so on the grounds that we had brought a federal claim. So the First Amendment claims actually what got us to federal court under their theory of removing from state court to federal court. And then last piece before maybe Joe, you want to kick and then we can talk about what came after the decision. Um, we took the position throughout, which I think is very reasonable. It's not that campaigns can't have NDAs. It's, Joe mentioned this at the top. NDAs are not 
bad or good in their own right. It's the devil's in the details. And um, the point was, it is a problem for a political campaign to have a never ending NDA that says you can never say something negative about someone who is the president of the United States or any other public official, and that that can be enforced against you forever, that you can be silenced into not exercising your First Amendment rights to, to criticize the government. That's the problem. The problem was this NDA. But Joe, I don't know, Joe or David, if, if either of you want to expound any more on the contract part of the I'll decision. Just a couple couple quick things. Going back to something Jessica said a minute ago about, um, you know, so the order of operations in the various NDA suits, she's 100% right that um, ours we won first. Um, and many courts have, and arbitrators, have since cited the opinion in our case in striking down um, other forms of Trump NDAs. I mean, the most recent example, this isn't exactly that, but Trump sued, we all know Michael Cohen, know and love Michael Cohen. Um, she, Trump sued him for $500 million. Um, that suit was dropped days ago. And his primary defense was that the contract that uh, Trump sued him on was unenforceable because it was essentially this same NDA contract. And you read his papers and it's just citing our case all through and through. Um, I want to mention one other thing. Jessica said that, um, you know, she they put out the call for anyone that wanted to join the class action. Nobody took it up. After we won, <laughs> they certainly came yeah. crawling out of the woodwork. Um, but, but we don't have to get into that. And then just on, just, that'll, just on, that, that, that'll be in the book, Joe, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can name that if you want. You know, we can name names. Um, but to John's point about, you know, what, what did the judge see here that caused him to, you know, really sort of really understand that this was not a, a legal contract? I think it was two things. Um, I think one was what John said. I think he, even if he thought as a technical legal matter, there was maybe roadblocks to turning this into a First Amendment issue. He clearly understood that the sort of chilling effects and the other First Amendment -y political speech and, and things like that that are sort of core First Amendment concepts were implemented here. And so he put language in the opinion that's going to be really useful um, going forward for years, not just in NDA cases, but in any cases that have to do with the restriction of employees political speech. Um, and then the second thing, the more prosaic thing that I think he recognized is that th there just really was no way for anybody that signed one of these to have any idea what they could and couldn't say as a very practical matter. You know, I don't want to, I, I can walk you, walk the, the audience through sort of the technical legalities of it, but that's sort of besides the point. It was a contract that essentially said, you better watch what you say forever. Um, and if we don't like it, you know, that's going to be a problem for you. And and as in, in when viewed in those terms, I think it's really clear um, why the judge looked at this and thought, no, I can't let something like this stand. That's, you know, that just can't be, the law just can't allow um, that kind of, you know, that kind of prohibition without any clear guardrails or without giving the person the idea of what is and isn't okay for them to do going forward. Absolutely. My, my team is so amazing and they, they could talk for hours and I would love to keep you here for hours, but I want to, I want to um, yeah. just keep this tight so we can share this with as many people as possible. Let's just talk about where we got um, after my individual victory pushing forward. We basically um, continued with the discovery process. We, we let the court, we signaled our intention to continue this to class certification and injunction. And I want to really bring this out. The, the injunction part of it and why it was so important. John, you want to pick us up from here? Sure. So part of it was a little bit of a mistake on our part. We Typically, when you ask for relief, you say, I want this is an including an injunction, injunctive relief. And we didn't put it in there and stand by the idea that the federal rules don't require you to do that because it says you can enter any relief. But the judge pointed out and said, hey, you got to amend, add a request for injunction. No problem. We did it. We added a, a request for injunctive relief. The, the key there, right, is like, so the decision the judge issued in March 2021 said Jessica is free from this contract. This contract is illegal, it, uh, you know, and no longer binds her. It can't be enforced. Here's a declaratory judgment. But we didn't have class certification yet, and we didn't have injunctive relief. And the contract, as we talked a little bit about, allowed 500 people, including one Donald J. Trump himself, to enforce the agreement, even though the agreement was technically between 
the campaign and signers. So the, they, all those people were third party beneficiaries of the agreement. Um, and so it was very important to get injunctive relief because injunctive relief is enforceable. It will stop someone from going out in this case and trying to enforce what's an unlawful contract rather than every other person has to wait until they get sued or arbitrated against and then has to raise the same um, arguments. So once we got the complaint amended, we launched in what's called discovery. As Joe mentioned at the outset, usually it's, it's done differently in a different order. Um, you, you know, if you have a legal claim, you state a legal claim, then you get discovery to see if you can prove it. And then you get summary judgment and then you get to trial from your trial. This case, we did a little bit backwards. Um, and in a class case, you need class discovery. Class actions, you know, have certain requirements. There has to be a certain, there have to be enough people. There has to be a sort of consistent issues across the class. And there's other, you know, we, the lawyers have to be good enough to represent the class. Jessica has to be an adequate representative, which is more than adequate as a representative. Um, but we needed discovery to show to once and for all, there weren't multiple versions of this contract. There weren't um, nuances that would make it um, legally impossible to certify a class. And sure enough, there were not. Um, we did that over the summer last year. Um, it was relatively straightforward. We didn't get as nearly as much information from the campaign as we probably should have gotten, but we didn't need that much information from the campaign because what it boils down to is everybody signed a contract. It's all the same contract. The contract's illegal. Um, and so the issues across the class are straightforward. Um, one piece to inject in this at multiple times, starting before the court decided the motion for summary judgment in March 20, so pre March 2021, before we got our first and most important victory, the campaign said, well, this is not even an issue because we're not going to, we promise not to enforce it. And I think Jessica and everyone on the team said, great, that does us, that does no good. And then in the summer, they filed something else saying, you can't certify a class because we prom we really promise, we really promise we're not going to enforce this, really truly. And uh, the their word said, is good for nothing. Yeah. And the court said, no, that's ridiculous. All these yeah. people can inform us. And then it happened again. I mean, I think there were th at least three times, maybe four. They came to court and said, judge, we're serious. We promise we're, you can trust us. And every time, yeah. thankfully, the court said, no, obviously no one can trust you. You have not yeah. litigated this in good faith ever. You don't seem to be on the path to do that. I'm going to take so, a moment on the on the controversy, just because this team deserves so much credit. And I and Joe encouraged me, so I'm taking Joe's cue. When that happened, when the campaign made those state voluntary, you know, they say voluntary. I mean, we already beat their ass several times. So when they made those quote unquote voluntary statements that they were not going to enforce this agreement, um, the uh, council for one of those other high profile cases claimed that this was their victory that they had brought about. And I just want to very clearly clarify it was this team that did that. That counsel for that other high, pro high profile um, litigant had actually begged our court to intervene in our case so that, that our precedent could apply to her. And the court ultimately denied that. But um, I just want to give credit where credit is due. It was absolutely this team um, that brought about that result. And we're, of course, grateful for everybody else that fought as well. Um, but it was this team's litigation that brought brought those um, those concessions. So go on, John, continue. Well, I'll be brief and toss it to somebody else because I'm talking too long here. But I think we, you know, there was some hemming and hawing over the summer about whether the campaign might be willing to settle. And they basically, the you know, same thing Joe talked about, delay, delay, delay. David had lived with it for years. Um, it, we at some point said, fine, whatever. We'll just go ahead and move for classification. We don't need a settlement. We've already won. We just have to get through the last technicality here on this case. So we filed our motion for class certification and proposed that the judge certify the class and then enter the relief we were asking for. And I believe it was the day after we filed the motion for class certification, the judge took a look at the case and said, you know what, I think there's room to resolve this case. So he referred us to mediation, which is very different than, than arbitration, um, but it was mediation through a court mediator. Um, we went to mediation in December and totally defer to anyone who wants to talk about what was said in mediation to the extent we can, um, but reached a resolution and proposed that we, um, the court sign off on the proposed settlement agreement. And the court then asked us to do class notice and say, well, let's first notify all the class members of the proposed settlement, make sure no one has an objection. And I think 
Joe is certainly in the best position to talk about the class notice period and then yeah. this sort of Well, you know what, guys? Let's 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 just kind of bring this quick to a T. I really want to get on to the implications of what this has. Like I have said, you know, I said this in this tweet that, you know, over a million people have seen as of now. You have no more excuses for silence. We are dealing with with an epidemic of silence in this country where um could could any of you guys have imagined that we would be dealing with Donald Trump as a candidate once again for 2024 after he tried to overthrow American democracy? This is absolutely obscene. Now more than ever is the time for people to speak out. Now they are free because of our work. We went to that mediation, that picture you saw up on the screen a couple of minutes ago. Maybe we can pull it up again. This is from last December um, where the team met and we we made that settlement that then was given to the court. Um, I wanted to mention we had, um, you know, th this was a complete concession from the campaign, complete victory for us. They agreed that um, my victory should apply to everybody else. And they agreed that we should ask the court to enter an injunction um, prohibiting third parties from ever enforcing the agreement. And they agreed to pay us a very large uh, portion of our legal fees. Um, now, this was our, I would say, our one tiny concession to the campaign in that mediation was, and this is in public record because we said it to the court, was that we were gonna keep that, that amount confidential that's what the campaign wanted. If it was going to take that to make everything else uh, an absolute victory, we were willing to do it. Well, the judge rejected that. Judge Paul Gardefi rejected even their attempts to hide what they paid us in fees. And I just I think that's so beautiful that this was a total victory for transparency. Nothing was hidden in the end. Even even those other high profile cases I've mentioned that walked away with um, significant legal fees at the in the end, their fee settlement was confidential. This fee settlement, 100% transparent, um, and um, and that was like earlier this year, and then we come full circle to last week where Joe um, represented, Joe spoke for us, uh, Joe, David, and Rachel Goodman of Protect Democracy, and the campaign's representative were all in court um, to have this final fairness hearing, and maybe, Joe, you can just put a yeah. pause. That, I'll, that I'll just say very, hearing. very briefly. I mean, it was what every lawyer's dream. We walked in with all these, um, you know, ideas of what might go wrong, and the judge took the bench, and he didn't even want to hear from us. He just started reading. He had already made up his mind. He was going to approve this thing. He had to put his reasons in the record, but that's all it was. Um, you know, that we had a, a few sort of Trump world acolytes call in and try to derail it. And he he basically laughed them, laughed in their faces. Um, I hope Judge Gard, if he doesn't watch this and hear me out him, but um, but yeah, and 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 most importantly, it's something that's been said a couple of times, but I just want to put a an exclamation point on it. The judge entered an order which has an injunction, and the injunction says neither the campaign or any other third party is allowed to try to enforce an agreement like this at all. And what that means is it's not now it's now it's not a contract anymore. Now it's a federal court order. And if anyone out there is listening to this that thinks they may be subject to one of these things or is currently facing an enforcement action from Trump or the campaign or anyone associated with him, you need to know that that is not allowed. That is in violation of a court order that is contempt of court. And, um, you know, you should feel free to reach out to any of the lawyers or Jessica on this call um, to discuss what your options are. But that is that is the key piece of this relief. There is a court that has said you may not try to enforce these things anymore, period. Um, and that's a really powerful thing. And I, I just want, you know, Jessica's entire entire audience to know that if they take one thing away from this, it's that. Absolutely. hundred percent, Joe. Thank you so much for that. And yes, that is the whole goal here to open up these floodgates so that there is active participation in our democracy. This is the whole point. This is what authoritarians try to do. They try to stifle debate and criticism. And that has been the goal of this team to remove that roadblock and allow, um, you know, truthful voices, participatory voices in our democracy to, um, be able to speak without fear. You absolutely have that right now. And if you wish to take it, it is yours to take. I wanted to, before we wrap, just address one more point. A lot of people have said, oh, Trump will appeal this. He appeals everything. This isn't over. Absolutely not. Explain, David, to us why this is not appealable and this is a done deal. 
Well, we wrote it into the agreement for one thing. It's not appealable because this was ultimately a settlement. That means both sides came together. We negotiated, we argued, uh, went back and forth. At the end of the day, in terms of protection of the class, we got everything we wanted. Uh, but it was nonetheless a compromise. Uh, to be fair, they could have paid his attorneys more money. But in terms of protection of the class, 100% uh, relief for them, as uh, John has already put on the record very well. We got the injunction. We got the protection for the class. They're fully released from these things. Uh, as Joe said very well, everybody listening to this podcast should know that now, if you were a worker, if you uh, were subject to uh, one of these NDAs two weeks ago, you are not subject to them today. You can speak out, and I would encourage you to do so. But since it's an agreement, agreements can't be appealed. That means that no side can appeal it. We couldn't appeal it either, and the campaign can't appeal it. We are done. We are done. And by the way, this is just a declaratory suit. So that that um, $450,000 figure that you see is to pay this amazing team. I got a nominal, nominal incentive fee um, for my work as class rep. This was not a damages case. There is a separate damages case. By the way, David and Mari Josephson still represent me on that. We don't get, you know, we don't get the limelight that a lot of cases do, but they are putting in the hard work. If you want to contribute to that case, and I would love to be able to raise enough to pay Mari and David before we see the end of this, you can do so at thejessicadenson.com slash donate thejessicadenson.com slash donate. We would love that. Um, my goodness, you guys, I love you so much. What a pleasure um, at the end of this, this journey and battle to be able to share this platform with you and share this victory um, for democracy. It's been, it's been great. Thank you, Jessica. Spectacular, Jessica. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, everybody. Um, subscribe to Lights On with Jessica Denson wherever you get your audio podcasts. You can also subscribe to my channel, Jessica Denson, on YouTube. There is a clear playlist there of Lights On where you can see all of the interviews and episodes, both the live episodes that we do on Fridays and these special episodes throughout the week. Thank you so much. Uh, speak now. Let your light shine. Thanks, everybody.